This is Daybreak Asia. I'm Tom McKenzie in Hong Kong. And I'm Betty Liu here in New York. Well, another rocky ride for stocks. Bond jitters remain. Our next guest says the markets have been dodging a bullet, but that's not going to last forever. Mariglim Chief Global Strategist James Rickards joining us now. Mariglim uses third wave artificial intelligence for predictive analytics in capital markets. So, Jim, uh, what are your algorithms showing you? Well, uh, you know, I think what happened on Monday, we all know what, what happened in the stock market, but I, I really do think we dodged a bullet. This is a warning. That could have been a lot worse. Down 5%, 4.6%. Could have been a lot worse. Bad. But, you know, so the stocks go down, lots of reasons for that. But then all of a sudden, this, uh, you know, this volatility goes up. Okay, that's, uh, you expect that. But then this Credit Square CTN, this inverse volatility note, the XIV, that mm -hmm. starts crashing. That's on its way to zero. So the people who are holding that, they're losing money. So they start shorting the S&P to hedge their losses. Now, it kind of stopped there. It's like a forest fire that burned up, but it could have kept going. What if those notes have been concentrated in a hedge fund? And that hedge fund got in distress. And then their counterparts start pulling right. This is what happened with long-term capital in 1998. It's right. obviously what happened in 2008. But are you seeing echoes of 2008? I am. I, in the dynamics. It's not so much the exact price. But so many derivatives, so much opacity, uh, so many um, what we call conditional correlations, things that are not normally correlated, right. but all of a sudden they become correlated under stress. And then the question is how far does it spread? Now, again, Monday sort of burned itself out. We've still had more volatility. That, that's, that, you know, Pandora's box of volatility is open. That's, that's here to stay. Yeah. Uh, and if we get weak data, I think you'll see the market more willing to go down. You know, for a year it was just up, up, up. The, the, Which the, was abnormal. Right. The, yeah. the market was impervious to data, but they'll be more sensitive to data going forward. You know, Jim, uh, you You've talked so much about gold, of course, right. and now people talk about gold as related to Bitcoin. Sure. You know, the normal or what you've traditionally seen is people jump into gold, right, as a safe haven. And now you've got other investors who say, no, 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 jump into Bitcoin. I want to play for you. Um, one comment from uh, one of our guests earlier runs this uh, Bitcoin fund or Phil Tilt Capital. And he, uh, this is what he said about gold. I want to get your take on sure. it. Sure. I don't know anybody under the age of 30 who's buying gold. <laughs> hey, that's true. That's a little dig, though, at these uh, at the older generation, isn't it? Listen, I don't know that many people over the age of 30 that are buying gold either. Well, it's actually true in the United States. Now, you go around the world, the Chinese are buying gold. Russia has tripled their gold reserves in the last 10 years. China has tripled their gold reserves in the last 10 years. Countries like Turkey, Iran, I call this the axis of gold. So these countries and these central banks and sovereign wealth funds are buying gold. In the United States, now, I, I buy gold. You know, I talk to my dealer. I say, how's business? It goes, never been worse, you know. Uh, but there is something generational. Uh, I have three millennial children, so it makes me an expert on this. Um, you know, with uh, Bitcoin, we're getting more data, and it is pretty Predominantly younger people, people under the age of 35, predominantly male. I don't know the reasons for that, but it's kind of like 70% right. of But do you, but of do you buyers see Bitcoin disrupting gold? No, not at all. Uh, you know, it's uh, uh, there is a little bit of, they're really just separate spheres. I don't see money going out of gold into Bitcoin. You got your Bitcoin buyers and your gold buyers. The Bitcoin buyers, unfortunately, that's going to $200. They have a long way down. Mm -hmm. Gold will make its way higher. James, we heard from the Winklevoss twins, they've obviously got a, a stake in Bitcoin. <laughs> they said this increased regulatory environment, the increased regulatory crackdown on the cryptocurrency space, that was ultimately going to prove a positive for Bitcoin. Well, it, well now, now look, the Winklevoss uh, twins and uh, Mark Andreessen and uh, Blythe Masters and a lot of really smart people are in this space. They're, the Winklevoss own Bitcoin, but they're not primarily buying and trading Bitcoin. What they're investing in is the blockchain technology, and I think the, the better word for it, distributed ledger technology. Although, interestingly, it looks like IBM and Intel are running away with that field. So I've been a big fan of blockchain. There are certain cryptos that uh, don't depend on uh, you know, a criminal use case, which is the case for Bitcoin. They actually have utility in terms of more efficient payment systems. You know, if you had to spend $60 to send $50 in Bitcoin, not a very attractive uh, transaction. So Bitcoin is a dead end. It's kind of like you have different hominids and you know, Bitcoin's the Neanderthal, they'll die out. But some of these other coins uh, may have a future. I'm not anti-coin, I'm definitely anti-Bitcoin, just because it's, uh, you know, it's a waste of money, it's a, it's a dead end. So Bitcoin Cash maybe could be something you'd look at. I mean, that's got no, greater no. practical uses. It's it, it's got uh, shorter transaction times, smaller fees. Yeah, a little bit better, but 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 not close. So you have to compete with Visa. You have to compete with Visa, Mastercard, and PayPal. So show me a coin that's faster, easier, and less expensive than Visa, Mastercard, and PayPal. Then I'll pay attention to that. But uh, there there are a couple that have that potential, by the way. But not Ripple, not Ether, not Bitcoin, not Bitcoin Cash, not any of the ones you mentioned. The fans are talking about this Lightning Network. I mean, if you understand what 
what Lightning is. It's basically saying, let's take our transaction off the blockchain. A whole bunch of us will do all these transactions and we'll net them out like a clearinghouse and then we'll bring it to the blockchain. But once you go off that, uh, once you go off the Bitcoin blockchain, you now have to trust the group you're in. Remember, Satoshi Nakamoto said this is a trustless system. Turns out there's no such thing as a trustless system. Even with Bitcoin, with that blockchain, to trust the miners. What if Russia put $50 billion, got 51% of the computing power, created a, a block that said they owned all the Bitcoin in the world, including yours, and validated the block? End of story. There's no recourse. There's nothing you can do about it. And that's cheaper than building aircraft carriers. My point is, there's no such thing as a trustless system. You just have to understand where the risk actually lies. James, I have a sense that this debate is going to continue uh, ahead. But thank you very much for your thoughts.